I sat down with my grandmother-in-law shortly after my youngest baby's birth. We marveled at the differences in our childbirth experiences. She had her children in the 50s and 60s in New York, where women were routinely anesthetized, and I had mine over the last 10 years in a process that involved prenatal testing, stem cell banking, and the, person, and the careful selection of medication based on my own genetic and environmental profile. It's not a secret anymore that technology and data are revolutionizing the way we understand health and treat disease. We're evolving from a one-size-fits-all approach to one where our individual biomarkers can affect our prognoses and treatment decisions. This is personalized medicine, and it's exploding. The Personalized Medicine Coalition had identified just 13 examples of personalized medicine 10 years ago, back in 2006. In 2011, that number was at 72, a five-fold increase. And here we are today with 113 examples, another 50% increase. While times have certainly changed, for my grandmother, as caregiver, they have not. In her current experience, helping her husband navigate the tricky waters of dementia and memory care, she wants to know, why is it that if we can do all of this amazing personalized medicine in fields like genetics, cancer, childbirth, and more, why is dementia so far behind the times? It's for a couple of reasons. First, it's because dementia is not one thing. It is a collection of symptoms with many different underlying causes. And just about everything about it can vary from person to person. In another example close to me, my grandmother, my father's mother, lost her ability to speak in English, a language she had been speaking in America, her adopted country, for over 40 years. With my grandfather, my mother's father, his cognition remained intact, so he was pretty sharp as his memory declined. He was fond of public speaking, and he would often repeat himself, which we all found funny until it wasn't, and we realized what was happening. The point is that as scientists, we have not yet fully figured out how to classify dementia into all of the different things that it really is. Another challenge stems from the fact that we tend to only seek out the doctor when things are very wrong. Full-blown dementia in its advanced stages is obvious. The condition that precedes it, however, called mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, that middle stage between normal forgetfulness and true dementia, is notoriously difficult to detect by a physician and often relies on us recognizing subtle changes in ourselves or in people we know well. Because early de detection of dementia remains a diagnostic challenge, patients that are participating in dementia research studies and clinical drug trials tend to be far along in their disease progression, perhaps past the point of no return. And the result is that these trials have had limited chance to succeed. Clearly, I've been affected by dementia in my family. I wish I could say that this is unique. However, having two out of four grandparents with dementia is about what we can expect as we live into our 80s, 90s, and beyond. Most of us will be touched by this at some point in our lives. As a neuroscientist, physicist, and entrepreneur, I'm on a mission to help us catch up our understanding of this mysterious, complex, and completely individualized disease state. We have a long ways to go, but much of what is needed is in our pockets already. Neurocognitive testing. Neurocognitive testing is traditionally administered by a neuropsychologist, and it's a way for us to peek under the hood and measure brain function non-invasively. The tests are effective 
and deceptively simple. They measure things like attention, memory, language, reaction time, and so on, essentially the dynamic features of our brain. By adapting these traditional tests to mobile, we can quickly and easily obtain a snapshot of the functioning of our brains. Let me show you an example on our app called BrainCheck. This is called the Flanker test, and the user, or the patient, needs to select the direction of the center arrow as quickly and as accurately as possible. When all of the arrows are in the same direction, the congruent case, it's pretty easy to do. However, when they're in different directions, like in the example that you see here, that's the incongruent case, it's a lot harder. And by measuring the difference in response time between the two cases, we can get a measure of executive function, our ability to squelch distractors and pay attention to only what's important, to the salient inputs. This is difficult to do in general, but much more so when you have cognitive impairment. This is an adaptation of the trail-making task, so the user has to tap 1A, 2B, 3C, etc., and it measures visual processing. And this next example is called the digit symbol substitution task. So you have to match the symbol to the number, in this case five, and key it in on the keyboard. So classically, these tests have strong predictive value for dementia. And when a collection of tests is given, we have a whole bank of them, the results can be taken together to look at which cognitive domains are impaired. We can now go a step further and take advantage of many of the changes that are happening in mobile technology. We can obtain a high resolution digital signature of scores, an amazingly detailed readout of cognitive performance. And I will call this a neurocognitive fingerprint. It's like a real fingerprint or a genetic fingerprint to borrow the analogy from what has led to much of the revolution in personalized medicine. It would allow us to quantify an individual's brain function with a kind of detail and high definition that has previously never been possible. In addition to richer data, which we can now obtain, we also need lots of it, lots of rich, multidimensional data that we can obtain with neurocognitive testing in our pockets. Imagine a clinical trial for the whole world. By tapping into the mobile and wearable device revolution, we can monitor our cognitive health in real time, instead of with once a year trips to the doctor. We can also do so in relation to other dimensions of our brain function, eating, sleeping, exercise, what medications we might be on, and also the status of other health conditions. You don't need an appointment. You can take neurocognitive tests at home and get a detailed readout of your cognitive function. This would give your doctor the tools to understand what might be wrong if results start to deviate from baseline. Cognitive health is as important as physical health. If we were all monitoring our cognitive health, we would have a massive database of neurocognitive profiles or fingerprints. Neuroscientists and data scientists could then begin to understand the relationship between these profiles and disease state with a kind of high definition never possible before. We would then begin to be able to classify things better. When we understand what we're dealing with, doctors will be able to give personalized prognoses. And what this means for all of us is that we will be able to have treatments that are ever more accurate and more targeted. We're all governed by our brains. Our brains are the most complex machines in the world, and they are what determine our realities. Much of what we do and who we are are the result of our neurocognitive capabilities. What I want for all of us is for our children and grandchildren to live long lives. I want them to have continuous tracks of their neurocognitive capabilities, and as soon as there's a change, 
to have a personalized intervention that halts them so that they can fully take advantage of their long lives. Thank you.